No, since the day one when, um, when Bangsa was established in 1974, you know, we had that big pulpit, no? It takes four guys to carry that pulpit. And then we downsized that pulpit <coughs> to, you know, that version two, where, you know, you take one guy to carry it. <coughs> and the last time I used that pulpit was in January last year when I spoke. I think that was the last Sunday I spoke at the church. And after that, I thought that we still have a pulpit. <laughs> but it looks like <laughs> in our new setting, there's no more pulpit. <laughs> and so we are down to this. Anyway, it's okay. No problem. <laughs> uh, Okay, um, we continue with our study on the Sermon on the Mount. And for this Sunday, it is on Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 to 48. And I'm given this overall subtitle of living under the authority of the king. In fact, what I'm going to share is really a continuation from what our brother Sun Tai uh, spoke on last week. But focusing on two very important aspects of life and conduct under the authority of the king. And so, um, we know that different Bible commentators have each said uh, different things, uh, how they classify the Gospels. Um, <clears throat> and each writer of the Gospel have their emphasis on who Jesus is. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel, it's about the Gospel of the King. And we have been worshipping worshiping God and Christ as the King. The Gospel of Mark is about the Gospel of the servant who went about doing good according to the will of the Father. The Gospel of Leo talks about, it's about the Gospel of the Son of Man. And in John, the theme is on the gospel of the Son of God. And Warren Wearsby, a Bible commentator, says that the theme of Matthew is the king and his kingdom. And so when we started the study of the Sermon on the Mount, um, we had the Beatitudes as the first 12 verses. It is about the character of kingdom citizens. And the second week, our brother Ming Fu touched on the second part on verses 13 to 26. It's about salt, light, and the law. And here it speaks of the influence of kingdom citizens. Last week, Sun Tai spoke on the conduct of kingdom, kingdom citizens in, in the aspects of adultery, divorce, and oaths, taking of oaths and swearing. And today, we continue with that conduct in the areas of retaliation and love your enemies, living under the authority of the king. I think our brother Sun Tai very nicely and eloquently broke down the Sermon on the Mount into the Beatitudes being the first 12 verses talks about our being, in, a, in other words, our character. And then flowing from that, from verses 27 right until chapter 7, and the other part of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, it is on our doing, our conduct, our being and our, con and our doing. We know that our character <clears throat> is what we are, and what we are determines our conduct, how we do and how we behave. And if we get our character right, our insight right, then our conduct, our external behavior will flow naturally. And so this, today, we will be speaking on two aspects of living under the authority of the king, a conduct of retaliation and love your enemies. And so as we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, as we open your word, we declare that your word is truth, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we know, Lord, that as we open your word today, 
and teach on these two aspects of our conduct. It is easy to verbalize it and put up a PowerPoint, but it's so difficult to obey and to live out these two aspects. And so, Lord, as we open your word and let your spirit speak to us, we also need our whole, the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our enabler to live out this in our lives. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point that Jesus addressed is on the word uh, on retaliation. In verse 38, it reads, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And this was a statement that was referred to by the Pharisees. It was quoted by the Pharisees. But it is extracted from the law of Moses in, Leu- uh, in Leviticus 24, 19 to 20, where it says, If a man causes disfigurement of his neighbor as he had done, so shall it be done to him, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he had caused disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. Now, the context of this law is, was that it was appointed to be executed by the magistrate courts, which acted as the ministers of God's law and justice. And when a victim is physically deformed or injured, then a law was to be applied. And so, this law was also given to define punishment on the offender. <clears throat> in cases where someone has suffered bodily injury or disfigurement, losing an eye or a fracture or a tooth. And this law was also given to restrain against greater punishment than what is necessary, so that the judge will not demand a life for the loss of an eye, nor a limb for the loss of a tooth. The judge was was to observe fairness. And that was the reason that this law was given. So in other words, this law was in the context of institutional and social evils that the offender should be fairly punished and to avoid further retaliation by the victim. So that was the context of why this law was given. But the Pharisees quoted this and extended this principle of retribution from the law courts where it should belong, where it belongs, to the realm of private and personal relationships where it does not belong. And so the Pharisees used this to justify personal revenge and retribution in personal and private uh, relationships and to trigger a spirit of vengeance to return harm for harm. And so what did Jesus teach in this context? Our Lord gave four illustrations. First, he says that, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. In other words, our Lord is teaching Do not take revenge on the evil person who has wronged you. You may have suffered injury, you have insult, or your pride and honour may be affected, but do not take revenge on the evil person. In fact, Jesus is, uh, is drawing out a lesson that we need to look at life in a larger view, to view our life and our place in this world, that God is the one to see that God, He is in control. He's the King as we have been worshipping Him. And also, secondly, to see ourselves that as much as He is King, we are living under the authority of the King. We are in God's hand. But thirdly, to see that the offender, the evil person, is not one who has caused the injury, but the offender is also part of fallen humanity. 
with the same pitiful limitations and sins, just like all of us. And the offender, just like us, needs God's mercy and grace. And this is the bigger picture. Some time ago, I dialogued with a guy um, who had been greatly offended by an unfaithful partner in marriage. And in any marriage, adultery is always a messy business. But the guy was able to take, not to take revenge on the unfaithful spouse, but, un but instead to forgive the person. Now, out of the many reasons that he was able to offer forgiveness to the, un to the unfaithful spouse, there was a startling vision that the person had of, this, of, her, of his spouse. That God made him see the unfaithful spouse as a victim. Now, this guy would have rightly said, claimed that I am the victim in this whole saga. But what he saw was that the spouse was also a victim. In other words, to see the spouse as part of fallen humanity, with the same limitations and sin as he, and just as much needing God's mercy and grace. And when this person saw this vision, it was a big step in the process of healing that relationship. That in seek, instead of seeking revenge on their unfaithful spouse, it was a process of healing because he accepted the offender as much as a victim as he was in that human relationship. And so, the first illustration that Jesus gave was do not resist that evil person. Secondly, if in verse 40, uh, it reads, If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tuning, let him have your cloak as well. <clears throat> now, here was this evil man who decides to bring a legal case and to use the law courts to prosecute and take away your shirt. And if you discover that he has a greater need to be met, let him have your cloak as well. So go beyond to assist him with his needs. Instead of reacting because he had brought a legal case against you, go a step further to help him with his need. And thirdly, in verse 41, Jesus quote another illustration and, and says, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Now, during the days of Jesus, a Roman soldier, it was a practice that a Roman soldier could compel a Jew to carry his personal belongings. And he can impose that errand and say, you have to do that errand for me. And the Jews would rightly, most likely, just go one mile and that's it. But Jesus says, at the end of one mile, instead of dropping the burden at his feet, Jesus thought to carry his burden for another mile. Go beyond to help a man with his needs. And we, most of us, we belong to that group to go the first mile. And here Jesus says, go the second mile. And the fourth illustration that Jesus gave was in verse 42. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn him away. In other words, do not evade someone who seeks your help. Do not ignore or turn away from those who need help. And so, our Lord's teaching on retaliation is an inversion of human order. The human order that we are so familiar with is to return harm for harm, to justify personal revenge, and to trigger a spirit of vengeance. 
the kingdoms or the kingdom or the corn is to, to return good for evil. Maybe I would add a qualifier here, qualifier here that you no. Know, we may need to resist evil for only for compelling reasons if the offender becomes violent or threatened to kill or cause public disorder. And then we will have to leave it to the uh, law court to handle such cases. Secondly, human order requires you to do what is legally required. And that's the, our human order to go the first mile. The kingdom order is that do more than I am strictly required in order to help others. And here it was the illustration that Jesus says, go beyond helping the evil man with both shirt and cloak and go beyond to help that government official who insisted your assistance. And thirdly, Give to those who have prior... The thirdly, the human order is we normally give to those who have prior claims on, uh, on us. For example, we would give to members in our family or we would give to those in order because we re have to return a favour. But the kingdom order is that we are to give to those who have asked. Why? Because they have asked and because they are in need. And we thank God that God had led our, our church to establish this um, welfare fund so that we are able to minister and help those who are in need. And also through Crest and Care Line, which is the latest uh, that um, Crest has established, to give to those who have asked. And although the calls have not I think so far there's only three calls that have come has, that have been channeled to Bangsa to help. But this is the start that we are to give to those who have asked and who are in need. Secondly, Jesus spoke on love your enemies. And so in verse 43, it reads like this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you have loved those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so, therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Christians in general are kind, helpful, and thoughtful. It's unlikely that they will be provocative and to invite enemies. We read from history that since the early 1900s, Christian missionaries have brought the gospel to unreached shores of unevangelized, in the in unevangelized world. And on many occasions, uh, the missionaries have at the same time established works of charity in those countries. For example, like setting of schools, orphanages and medical stations to provide medical care. And many in, in our country, even in our congregation, have been blessed through the excellent education uh, standards in the mission schools um, in our land. So Christians 
to a certain extent, have been respectful for their works of charity to society. And the icon, Mother Teresa of India, is a good example of his works of love and charity. But the attitude towards Christians have evolved and changed quite dramatically over the past 20 to 30 years. Today, Christians are targeted as enemies. According to Open Doors, which is a Christian organization that monitors the plight of suffering Christians, there are about 340 million Christians living in areas under persecution. The red areas will be where there are extreme persecution. The orange areas are where persecution, to a lesser extent, do exist. In other words, it is estimated that one in eight believers worldwide are targeted as enemies. <clears throat> I subscribe to the Barnabas Fund newsletter, which is uh, which is pioneered. Barnes Busman was first pioneered in the UK uh, by, uh, by someone who's associated with the Brethren Assembly. And so it has been a work that has gone on for many, many years. And Barnabas Fund is also another Christian organization that helps the persecuted and the suffering church worldwide in order to meet their needs. And as I read this newsletter, um, <clears throat> It is so depressing and so di distressing to read of God's people being victimized, being targets of discrimination, and suffer severe aggression. And this is just a sampling. And each, this is a sampling of reports that came in September, October. And on average, 12 very severe reports. First one, Christian sanitization workers denied protective equipment and as a result died in a poisonous sewer. And this is in Pakistan where many Christians are engaged in 3D work. You know what's 3D work? No Malaysians want to do 3D work. Dirty, dangerous, and difficult. And so here were, uh, there's this was a situation where <coughs> sanitization, Christian sanitization by virtue of their status in society, they had no choice but choose this 3D work. They were denied this protection and they died. Another one in Nigeria. I think this happened in October. Gunmen killed 34 in attack on Christian community in the state of Nigeria, in the northern state. And that's where uh, uh, tensions arise between Christians and and the non-Christian group in that up, uh, northern state. Another one, in India, five injured as radical nationalists attack church service in this area in India. And the fourth one here in Myanmar, soldiers ransack villages attacking churches in Chin State. And on average, as I say, about 12 incidents of such extreme nature happening in that part of the world, mainly in the red, uh, marked red in the map that I showed earlier. But Jesus had foretold, you will have enemies. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 25, he, it reads, if they had called the master of the house Belzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household. Belzebub is, uh, is a name given to the prince of devils. And what Jesus is saying is that if the Son of God, Jesus the Son of God, got criticized and labeled as the prince of devils, such extreme attachment given to him, how much more you, his followers of Christ, will be most likely targeted as enemies. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so, Christians will have enemies. 
they will be accused of false things. In response, what does teachers, Jesus teach? Matthew 5, verse 43, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. How do we love our enemies? There are four motivations to love our enemies. Romans 5 verse 10 says, For if, when you were enemies, all of us, when you were enemies, enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And here what Jesus teaches is that God saved us while we were his enemies. We were not friends with God when we were saved. We were his enemies. And so the root origin of how to love our enemies is to experience being loved as the enemy of God. And we are able to love our enemies because we have first received God's love when we were still his enemies. Secondly, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, it says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. When we respond to love, to bless, and pray for our enemies, we become like children of God. For our Heavenly Father loves like that. God treats both good and evil people equally. How? Because He makes the sun rise on both the evil and on the good. And he sends the rain showers and the monsoons on the just and the unjust. And so when we love the good and the evil and the just and the unjust, we show ourselves to be the children of God. And we prove that we have the same DNA as our Heavenly Father. <clears throat> Third motivation to love in Romans 12, 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for the good things in the sight of all men. And if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but give place to wrath as it is written. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. <clears throat> now, one of the reasons that it is so difficult to love our enemies is that it feels like they will be, we are allowing them to get away with murder. But God says no one gets away with murder because vengeance belongs to God. Justice will be done. All sins will be punished. <clears throat> and sins will be punished on the cross for those who have repented. And sins will be punished in hell for those who do not repent. The fourth motivation to love our enemies is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward <clears throat> in heaven. 
There is a reward in heaven, spectacularly beyond anything we lose on earth when we love our enemies. And so in summary, four motivations to love our enemies. First, God loves us, had loved us when we were his enemies. We were loved as enemies of God. Secondly, when we respond to love and bless and pray for our enemies, we become like the children of our Heavenly Father. And it proves that we have the same DNA as God. And thirdly, we are to live peaceably with all men, repay no one for evil, for evil, because vengeance belongs to God. And fourthly, there is a reward in heaven, spectacularly beyond anything we lose on earth, when we love our enemies. But the question is, how do we love our enemies? How do we get the means and power to love our enemies? It's humanly impossible. You know, when I read these uh, reg regular Barnabas Fund newsletters, it's so distressing. How to respond to love those offenders? Uh, the most I can do to respond is I'm just neutral. I can't even go that next step to pray and bless those who have uh, persecuted the Christians. I j at this stage <laughs> in my Christian uh, journey, I can just be neutral. <clears throat> well, the step of loving our enemies begins with receiving the character as kingdom citizens, as described in the Beatitudes. The step of loving our enemies begins with having the fruit of the Spirit. And we are familiar. In Galatians chapter 5, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. <clears throat> the ability to love it's not through human effort, but it is through the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not a kind of a divine milkman who drops off this fruit of love into our lives and then moves on to the next house. The Holy Spirit is not a kind of a grab food delivery man who drops off the fruit of love as and when we want. The Holy Spirit gives of himself to us. He dwells in us. And in the holy sharing of himself in us, the love of God is poured into our hearts. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The bringing of divine love into the human heart is the most profound work of the Holy Spirit. And he causes the giving of God's love as it is poured into our hearts as much as the receiving of that love. He enables us to receive that love. And so let us welcome this working of the Holy Spirit as he gives himself to us. Let us fellowship with the Holy Spirit in praying for his working in our lives. And let us commune with the Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul writes in uh, the benediction, which we are, a number of us are familiar with in 2 Corinthians 13, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion the Holy Spirit be with you all. The bringing of divine love into the human heart is the most profound work of the Spirit. He is the executor. The Holy Spirit is the executor who brought the grace of Jesus into us, leading us to the Father. And He is also the agent that pours the love of God into our hearts. But how do I fellowship 
and experience the communion of the Holy Spirit in my, in my life? How do I posture ourselves before the Lord to dialogue with the Holy Spirit and to experience all the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus? <clears throat> There's a person by the name of Alan Hood um, who initially was part of the International House of Prayer in the U.S. And he gave a, three, a series of three, three, three series, he spoke on three series, on intimacy with the Father, intimacy with the Son, and intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Helping believers to grow in their closeness and in their communion with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. And he shared how he was lifted to the Lord using five simple phrases that forms the acronym TRUST. And this acronym TRUST uh, <clears throat> helps him to catapult, so to speak, or to deliver him into the presence of the Holy Spirit as he communed with the Holy Spirit in prayer. We know that you know, different Christian traditions uh, share the, talk about communion with the Holy Spirit in, based on their background. And we used to talk to a charismatic or to a Pentecostal. So communion with the Spirit is speaking in tongues. And some of us may not be able to you know, enter into that. But here was this man, Alan, who, who shared that, you know, that communing with the Holy Spirit to enable you to live the life. Because unless we have the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in us, we can't love our enemies. There's no way. It's not a human effort. But it has to come through the Holy Spirit. And so how do I commune and fellowship with the Holy Spirit? And he shared this uh, acronym T-R-U-S-T. In our quiet meditation, and in our fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. T stands for thank you. To create that attitude and a posture of gratitude to the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for dwelling in us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing the grace of Jesus and the love of God pouring into our lives. R stands for reign in me. Reign in me, Holy Spirit. Reign in my body, reign in my mind, and reign in my emotions. This is a posture of surrender and submission. Reign in me so as to overcome the sins that still, the residual sins and the remaining sinful habits. Reign in me so that I may have full surrender to the ways and life of God and have kingdom character in residing in me. You, use me. Use me today, Holy Spirit. Use my tongue to give holy words, words of encouragement. Use me to return good for evil. Use me to help others who need my name. Manifest your power so that as you use me, I may have your power to minister to those who need my help. S, S stands, holds, strengthen me, Holy Spirit. Strengthen my resolve against sin and strengthen my devotion in my heart for love. Strengthen my spirit so that I may be able to bless and pray and love those who hate me even my enemies. Strengthen me for righteousness, holiness, and love. And T, teach me. Teach me on every matter in life. Teach me on financing so that I may wisely lay up treasures in heaven and not on earth. Teach me how to bring up my children, how to sow into their lives so that we, you can 
that they may be able to bear much fruit. Teach me in my, how to build my home on rock and not on sand. Teach me in my marriage how to keep it pure and undefiled. And teach me in my jobs. During this time of pandemic, I may need to change jobs. Teach me. Oh, wise spirit, teach me about everything you want me to know and you want me to do. And so, let us commune with the Holy Spirit and to allow him full fellowship with us so that we may be able to do, to live under the authority of the king in the areas of retaliation and the areas of loving our enemies. And we trust that the Lord will speak to all our hearts uh, and the Holy Spirit will continue to minister and to enable us uh, in our journey and to live under kingdom principles. In Jesus' name we pray.